Welcome to another edition of the Camel Clutch Blog Extra, where we go deeper, take a more in-depth look at one of the more popular blogs on the website here on the podcast. And it is a real pleasure today to be joined by a gentleman who's been contributing to the website for well over a year now. He is the writer of the WWE Wrestler of the Week and has uh, pretty much taken over as the pay-per-view preview and prediction guy for the WWE on the CCB. And that is Seth Gutenplan. Seth, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure to to do this with you. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Really, really looking forward to it. Always a fan of your writings, and uh, I know you've uh, been been doing uh, podcasting of your own for quite some time. So I'm excited to to do this with you. Absolutely, same here. Excellent. All right, so let's get right into it. I put together a top 10 list of best WWE comebacks. And as part of the criteria, um, what I did, and, and this this uh, shortened the list anyway, was um, I, I, I kept it to a year. So for anybody to be on this list, they had to have left for a full year or been out of the picture for a full year because right away I had people coming to me and saying Triple H, Eddie Guerrero, but these are guys that left for a long amount of time, but not quite a year. So what I did was I tried to keep it. Well, I did. I kept it to guys that left for a year minimum. And my criteria for, for putting people on the list was somebody that came back and, and came back bigger um, or maybe came back and, and made just as, as much of an impact as when they left. But somebody that came back and didn't necessarily achieve the same level of greatness that they had when they were previously in the company, they didn't make the list. Maybe top 15, top 20, but not top 10. So uh, Seth, let's kick it off here um my first choice at the top of the list was bruno san martino and i might be a little partial because i've interviewed bruno uh about a dozen times and uh and and I, i've got to be a friend of his over the years so uh it may be a little partial on my part but i think when you look at best comebacks in wwe history you got to put this guy right at the top of the list because he was in the wwe in 1961 uh well before our time as as wrestling fans and our time on this planet and he had a falling out with vince mcmahon senior and tootsmont he he talked about it on my radio show a couple of times he felt he wasn't getting paid what he was worth so he left and they actually blackballed him they played a lot of games with him they 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 went to commissions and made sure that bruno didn't get licensed and he wasn't able to wrestle in in that particular part of the country or that particular part of the world, if they had that kind of clout and eventually cooler heads prevailed. Uh, they needed Vince and, and toots needed to do something for business. Uh, Buddy Rogers was, was on the way out and they brought Bruno back. And then Bruno went on to a seven year title reign. And not only was he a seven year champion, I mean, the man just became uh, an immediate part of popular culture. I mean, you talk to people that grew up in that era. They, they all know who Bruno San Martino is. They all love Bruno San Martino. Seth, when, I looked at the list and I put it down on paper. I started with about 20. I just couldn't think of anybody else who had a better comeback than Bruno San Martino. Yeah, like you said, he's a little bit before our time. And, and, and you are definitely someone who, like you said, is friends with him and knows a lot more about his career than I do. But you, you can't ignore the fact that, that when he came back, he, he had that illustrious run as as the longest running reigning champion of, of all time. And, and obviously uh, last year with CM Punk's reign going um, as long as it did, um, it brought back uh, memories for people of Bruno Sammartino and, and, and look what ended up happening with him entering the hall of fame. So, you know, you can't, you, you can't talk about comebacks without talking about the longest reigning champion of all time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I put the list out and I've gotten some feedback and um, I haven't had anybody argue with it. And yeah, you know, it's one of those things with Bruno where you didn't watch him. I didn't watch him growing up. I mean, again, before I, well, I watched him a little bit, he was on the way out um, when I when I started watching wrestling, but not, of course, uh, during his peak. But yeah, I have been fortunate enough to learn a lot about him just in, in talking to him. And I guess just, just becoming fascinated at that point. And what's what's cool now, um, as we're recording this, Bruno's back in the fold and, and fans who 
who didn't get a chance to experience Bruno and watch him will not be able to to relive uh, his, his glory days with DVDs and, and that kind of thing. But um, but yeah, I, you know, Seth, um, when you, when you look at it on paper, I don't think there's anybody else that that's number one uh, above Bruno. Uh, I have to agree with you. Great. Great. All right, let's move on to number two. And if there was anybody on this list that was going to give Bruno a run for the money, to me, it was Hulk Hogan. And it was Hulk Hogan's return in 1983. I mean, you want to talk about a comeback, at least when 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 Bruno, I think Hogan might have even had um, a better place on the cards when he left as, uh, you know, back in, in the 80s, in the early 80s, than, than Bruno. And again, that's all, you know, up to somebody that was watching uh, during in that time. So um, I, I can't I can't confirm that. But, you know, Hogan left and when he left, uh, he was feuding with Andre the Giant, but he was losing to Andre the Giant all over the country. Uh, he had some matches with Bob Backlund here in Philadelphia. Uh, they had on the Spectrum and Backlund beat him here at the Spectrum. And um, and Hogan was gone and he left and he went on to do to do Rocky three and, and, and rebuild his career in the AWA and New Japan. And then Hogan comes back and, you know, takes takes the pro wrestling world by storm. I was watching wrestling at that time. And I remember sitting in front of my television set and, and seeing him coming out to uh, to rescue Bob Backlund, who I believe was getting uh, double teamed by Tiger Chung Lee and maybe Samoan Samu. I'm not really sure, but I'm, I, I kind of I vaguely recall uh, Tiger Chung Lee uh, in the mix. And I could be completely wrong on that one as well. But, you know, Hogan comes back, revolutionizes the wrestling industry, kind of, you know, the same way that Bruno did, where he revolutionized the wrestling industry in his own way at that particular time. And of course, Hogan has gone on um, and, and there'll be many that, that could argue this, Seth, but I think he's gone on to become the most recognizable professional wrestler in in wrestling history. I mean, his his place in history is is what it is, uh, like him or not. And um, you know, next to Bruno, I can't think of anybody else that that achieved more the second time around than than Hulk Hogan. Yeah, um, I I was born in '84, so I didn't know Hogan uh, before he he left. Um, all I know is about what I, I've read and, and seen videos of, but. <clears throat> You know, you you can't deny the fact that beforehand, I think they called him the, the. He had a different nickname. I don't think he was Hulk Hogan, right? I think it was the Incredible Hulk Hogan. The Incredible Hulk Hogan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I knew he had some sort of nickname that that was dropped um, when he came back. But when I started watching, he that was, you know, the the height of of Hulkamania in the late eighties, early nineties, um, and like you said, he is definitely the most recognizable pro wrestler of all time. I think way ahead of Bruno Sammartino. I think the, the people who were watching wrestling in the sixties know Bruno, but you know, Hogan from the eighties till now he he's done so much and it started with the, the Hulkamania in, in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, as somebody that grew up during that time period, I could tell you, Seth, you know, I started going to the spectrum to see, see live WWF wrestling during uh, the Bob Backlund era um, about a year before Hogan came in. Um, and I was there immediately when, when Hogan came in, I was there for his first title defense and I wound up uh, begging my, my parents to take me every uh, month that he was here after that. So, so I was there during that time period. And I mean, it was just so different. Um, and, and, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. I guess maybe the only comparison would be to somebody that was going to WWE shows um, a year before Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, broke through. And then all of a sudden you're going a year later and you're in the middle of the Attitude Era and Austin breaking through. Um, and that's the same thing here. You know, I mean, the shows were exciting and, and, and they were very hot. But when, when Hogan broke through, I mean, it was just – it was just something else. I mean, it was just electric, you know? I mean, the, the announcers say that, and it's very cliche, but it really was electric um, when he was... Have you ever seen uh, Hogan live? I mean, I know you were a youngster then, but, but you know, later on as a fan? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I went to shows in the early to mid-90s. Well, I guess... What, what year did he go to WCW? 93, 94? I think it was 90, 93, 94, somewhere around yeah. there, yeah. So I was already going to shows and, um, you know, there's nothing like uh, seeing Hulk Hogan live. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so 
Let's move uh, next on the list. And here uh, we get into the list where there's – I wouldn't say this is in any particular order, just just guys thrown out there. And then here's a name that a lot of people listening to this podcast would, would probably uh, be able to relate to because this is a guy that they actually watched. You know, this wasn't, you know, 1984, 1963. We're talking about 2007 – and when Chris Jericho came back to the WWE, now Jericho, of course, had uh, so, some some great success during his first go around because he was the first ever unified champion. But at the same time, he was more or less a transition champion for uh, Triple H. And and I felt that Jericho never really um, reached his full potential the first time around. And the second time around, he struggled a bit early on. He came in and had that feud with Randy Orton. And then he did that deal with, with JBL. And, and he just wasn't clicking the, the way that, that um, you know, they were hoping that he would. And then all of a sudden, you know, once he started with that, that subtle heel turn and then heel turn with Shawn Michaels. I think, you know, for me, his feud with Shawn Michaels back during that time period, um, maybe the best of the modern era. I don't know how long you want to go back um, when you consider the modern era, but uh, certainly one of the, the greatest feuds in the history of the WWE. And of course, he he won the, the world championship. And I just and, and he completely reinvented himself. He he changed his gimmick. He started coming out with suits. He was talking. He was delivering promos more like Nick Bockwinkle as opposed to to the wild Chris Jericho um, of, of the first go around. And when you think of guys that that really, um, you know, had had a second, uh, a whole second career, like a rebirth, just a, just um, reaching a whole new level in their career, I, I don't think there's many that you can uh, think about um, without looking past Chris Jericho in 2007. Well, I, I have some thoughts about about this particular pick of yours. Was this when um, when Orton punted uh, CM Punk? And then Jericho took his place and won the championship. Is this when Jericho won the championship that way? No, I'm going back further. I'm going back to that when... That was 2009 then, right? Yeah, I'm going back to when John Cena um, got hurt. I think he tore his pec, and he was in the middle of the feud with Randy Orton, and Cena was out. And, and then he made that return at the Royal Rumble uh, the next year, but then Jericho came in and kind of took his spot at that point. Okay, okay. Um, you see... It, it, this is definitely when Chris Jericho, as you said, um, made that good heel turn and he started wearing the suits. As you said, I think this might have been the first time he had the shortened hair cut mm-hmm. um, and, you know, he had a good run. But it's hard to say if his run after this was better than his run before, because I, I not just being undisputed champion, but. Even from the very start, from when he made his debut, um, interrupting The Rock and with the whole Y2J thing, he really, he really accomplished a lot in that first run. So it, I, I think it's hard to say whether or not, you know, post two thousand, from two thousand to two thousand nine, was better than than his run before him. That's a fair point. That's, that's, that's definitely a fair point. And he certainly had a lot of peaks um, during that run um, early on from 99 to um, I don't know when he left 2004, 2005, 2000. I'm not re- I'm not really sure of, of when he left um, off the top of my head, but I don't know. It's definitely you can definitely argue that point, especially when you look back on that resume and he was undisputed world champion at that time. I certainly um, can respect that that viewpoint. But I don't feel that he ever really reached his full potential in the ring during that time. And there were a lot of politics being played at that time, a lot of guys trying to hold him back. And I think during this run here, and, and really I credit it to the to the entire Shawn Michaels feud, really, um, he just – I guess you could say I, I feel like he cemented his legacy uh, during that time. Yeah, I think this that was probably his best run as a heel in the mm-hmm. WWE. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Um, and speaking of Shawn Michaels, let's go next on the list to Shawn Michaels. Now, Shawn Michaels came back in 2002, and it's hard to say whether he would, whether this comeback was better than than his original run because I mean he was so decorated that during that original run, the comeback he only won the championship one time and it was for a very brief amount of time when he first came back. But when you look at the body of work from from 2002 until the time that that he retired against the Undertaker. I, you know, and, and you could definitely argue this because he had some classic matches, the two ladder matches, the the Iron Man match with Bret Hart. But I, I just think that 
he had um i just think his body of work in the ring was just so incredible and, and just even that much better than the body of work that he had earlier in his career and and i think a lot of that too was the attitude i mean you listen to interviews with sean now and he was cocky and he was arrogant during that first run and 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 sure he'd like to go out there and steal the show but he wasn't necessarily as cooperative inside the ring um as as far as helping get guys over as he was during the second go around i mean I remember a match that he had on Raw with Mark Henry, and Mark Henry wasn't exactly knocking it out of the park at that time. That was phenomenal. Um, and, and it's just amazing when you look back because Michaels, his his back was busted. He was retired. He was out of the business. And he comes back at that SummerSlam, doesn't miss a step, um, and, and just has this, this amazing run uh, during that time period. Yeah, I, I have to agree with these points that you're making specifically because – like you said, I, I do think he accomplished more in his first run. But at the same time, coming back from such a serious injury and after, you know, four years was very impressive to then go another eight years, yeah. um, you know, at the top of his game. Um, and, you know, I think it was probably during that time that he was off that he became the born again Christian. Is mm-hmm. that right? Yep. So I have to agree with another point that you were making and that his attitude was different. And I credit it to, to that, to the becoming a born again Christian and he, his views on things, you know, he, he got, I feel like he got in trouble early on in, in his WWE career. Mm-hmm. And he was, you know, fooling around, not getting along with a, a lot of people backstage early on. Um, but, you know, him and triple H, both of them, during this 2002 to 2010 time period, really both changed um, backstage a lot, not just in the ring. Um, but like I said, you know, he, he put on some great matches in that second run, but it's hard to, to say whether or not it was better than his first run. It was just different. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, next on the list is Sergeant Slaughter. And Sergeant Slaughter is a guy, um, you know, I could talk a whole lot about. I'm sure you can, too, because you were watching wrestling during that time period where he won the uh, WWE championship. You know, I remember Sergeant Slaughter when I first started watching watching wrestling. And well, I would well when I first started watching wrestling, I would read them about him in magazines, and I would read stories about him and Backlund. At that time, um, I, I really didn't didn't get the show too often, and uh, he had that first go around. I think it was like an '81 with Backlund for the WWF Championship. They didn't win it, obviously. Then he had that second go around, which I watched every week when he came out and beat up Bob Backlund during the Harvard Step Test. And I went to one of their matches in at the Spectrum, which was a Texas Death Match, which was just awesome. It was just it was just great. And and, um, and of course, all those uh, crazy Iron Sheik matches he had. So then he leaves and he becomes somewhat of a, a cartoonish character with the, the G.I. Joe. And he was in the AWA and he really wasn't doing a whole lot in the AWA. And then he comes back with this this heel persona that's just so far to the left of what he was doing before. He's aligning himself with, with Iraq at just a time where tensions were high in America. And he beats the ultimate warrior for the World Heavyweight Championship. And, you know, I mean, when you talk about comebacks, I mean, his run on top was 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 pretty short compared to a lot of these other guys that we're talking about. Even Jericho's run was a lot longer um, during his comebacks than Slaughter's was. But, you know, from a guy that came from uh, coming close a couple of times uh, uh, to winning the championship and headlining those matches with Backlund to finally breaking through and not only beating the Ultimate Warrior for the World Heavyweight Championship, but then uh, headlining a WrestleMania with Hulk Hogan. Um, You know, in terms of comebacks, I I think it's a great one. Yeah, well, when during this time <clears throat> was actually when I started watching wrestling was during this um, thing where he was with the evil Saddam Hussein of Iraq. Yes, um, that was really when I started watching wrestling. So I don't know too much about his first run, but I will say that it's, it, not, it wasn't just a little bit impressive that he ended the reign of Warrior, but Warrior had just beaten Hulk Hogan. Yep. The, WrestleMania before, so to then go with the guy who just beat Hulk Hogan um, is very impressive, though I think he would end up losing it to Hogan um, the following WrestleMania, but, you know, 
they they did a great job of capitalizing on that heel character. I mean, how much better could you have written a story for a heel than to align him with with that kind of character and that whole story? So it was just overall the story and character and development was was very good. Yeah, yeah. And especially a guy that when he left, I mean, he was right up there with Hogan as far as uh, popularity goes. I mean, I remember I saw him and the Iron Sheik uh, at the Nassau Coliseum. And I mean, just the place went absolutely bonkers for Slaughter. And here in Philly, he was here. They, they only came here once, which was really bizarre. But he came here once. It was him and Junkyard Dog against Sheik and Volkov. And the place just went nuts. Uh, I remember those guys coming out to bat to the bone. But yeah, going from, you know, ju- just such a, a beloved um, patriot. Um, that was his gimmick at the time. And coming back and just aligning with Iraq and, uh, you know, in the middle of the war. Um, just just great stuff. Uh, really, really was. And his promos were great, too, back then. Not only that, he's actually, and, and we didn't even bring this up, Seth. He's actually aligned with the Iron Sheik during this time. It's bitter enemy right yeah yeah that's yeah. good stuff all right so let's go to, to 1987 and the return of the million dollar man ted dibiase and what a lot of people might not realize is that ted dibiase was a wwf regular um several years before that not only was he a regular he was actually a champion in the wwf he was the wwf wwf north american champion uh which didn't last long the title didn't last long but, um, you know, you, you, you probably, when I say you, fans, um, have probably seen some of those matches years later because I think there's a match with him and Hulk Hogan from Madison Square Garden that's one of the, on one of the Hogan DVDs um, that, that came out. And I, I know they had, they had their match on MSG Classics as well. So DiBiase was kind of just this journeyman, mid-carter, and then he comes back with this great gimmick um, like Slaughter, um, you know, takes over as, as a top heel, um, sort of kind of won the championship when he bought it from Andre the Giant and had to had it stripped uh, from him uh, thanks to, to Jack Tunney. But, you know, from from where he came just as a mid-carter, North American champion, to, to main eventing with Hogan and Savage and, and becoming an icon, you know, I mean, he really is one of, one of the iconic wrestler one of the more iconic wrestlers of the time period i think it was a hell of a comeback yeah well you'll probably not be surprised but i obviously didn't know ted dibiase well for from his first run because that was a few years before i started rest, uh watching wrestling me too even me too yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, but i i have seen those clips of him versus hogan and i i don't even recognize him yeah um he he looks so different and when you have a gimmick like the million dollar man we we just saw that him um last week on raw the old school raw mm-hmm. that's a gimmick that is going to last forever um you know Ted DiBiase Jr tried to come in and and do a little bit with it you you I don't know if you saw the picture with JBL and Alberto Del Rio yep. that one of them posted talking about how it's the same gimmick you know different generations of the same gimmick um you know it it's it's everyone's going to remember the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. No one ever talks about his time before that when, as you said, he was a journeyman. You know, I, I didn't even know that that character existed until I saw that clip with Hulk Hogan. Yep, yep, yeah, way before my time, and um, and I didn't realize it either. Um, but you know, I remember reading the magazines at the time, and he looked so different. Um, before he came in, and right before he came in here in Philly, we started to get the UWF where DiBiase was wrestling. So we had started to kind of morph. He lost some weight and dyed his hair blonde. So you know, I started to see a little bit of it. But I mean, totally different character than than the guy I grew up on watching in the magazines. That was a heel in Mid South and Georgia and and all those places. Right. Yep. So uh, Jeff Hardy, Jeff Hardy in 2006, uh, Hardy uh, left the WWE when he had uh, problems with the wellness policy or the wellness policy had problems with him, depending on how you look at it. Went to TNA, no shows and pay-per-views, had some 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 OK matches and then just comes back out of the blue. And 
I don't think the WWE ever planned to put him in that headline spot. I don't think when they brought him back, they planned to put him there. But just little by little, just the fans just started to eat him up. And it was it was the fans that dictated almost almost like Daniel Bryan in a sense where, you know, the WWE never really had intentions of pushing Bryan that hard. But just the fans started with the yes, yes, yeses. And the fans just started to, to get behind Jeff Hardy. And then all of a sudden he is in main event matches with Randy Orton. He's the world champion. He's on WrestleMania in in in, uh, in prime spots. I think it was a hell of a comeback by Hardy during that run. Yeah, the one thing I remember from that comeback is if he hadn't left again, I guess to go back to TNA, I felt that that run could have lasted so much longer. Yeah, um, he what he did achieve a lot in his first run. I mean, he and Matt Hardy were were um, enhancement talent when they first entered WWE. Um, I think you can probably find, you know, those kinds of episodes of velocity and whatever with, with them as jobbers. Sure. Um, or even before that superstars. Um, but you know, he, he did show a lot, um, good work the first run. Um, I remember obviously the, the match with the undertaker, a lot of people, um, still talk about, um, and you know, he, he won a lot of mid card titles, um, tag team titles, obviously, with with his brother, but it was in 2006 that that, like you said, he he got that push for the the world title, and I do think that if he hadn't left on his own, he could have been champion for a lot longer. Yep, yep, me too, me too, and I still think if he were to come back whenever his TNA contract is up, I think he would jump right back into that uh, main event mix uh, if he was to come back at some point. He's just a very likable character, even though he's gotten into so much trouble and had so many issue, personal issues. He's just his, his talent is just so amazing that 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 fans just can't help but love him. Yep. Yep. So let's go to 2011, uh, not too long ago, and talk about The Rock. And this one, I can certainly understand if people want to argue with this pick here because. Did he accomplish more when than his first go around? Absolutely not. He certainly did not, and I'll be the first to admit it. But I just thought it was a hell of a comeback. I mean, he came in there, and when he came back, he didn't miss a beat. He headlined two WrestleManias against John Cena. He won the championship late in his career, and on top of that – I think what's most impressive is you look at the, look at what he did from a business standpoint. I mean, he jacked up those ratings every time he walked out there. I mean, there are very few guys you can look at that make that big of an impact on the ratings week by week. And Rock was one of them. And what was even more impressive is that Rock drew the biggest WrestleMania buy rate in, in company history with John Cena. That's huge. I mean, we're talking about 20 – well, at the time, uh, what was it? WrestleMania 28. There were, there were 27 – previous WrestleManias and and they topped that and it wasn't because of John Cena it was because of The Rock and I could certainly understand if somebody says well he didn't come close to to achieving what he did the first go around I get it but you know when I'm sitting here looking at great comebacks I just thought his comeback was fantastic in 2011 well I am gonna argue that that (laughs) his first run was so much better and if it weren't for that first run he wouldn't be who he is in 2011 um, you know, he, he left to make the movies, but the whole rock character developed in the late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> so the only part that I will agree with you is from the business standpoint, is that the, the name, his, his name and John Cena's name together, they're, they're two of the biggest WWE superstars of all time in terms of their name and popularity. So in, in that regard, I'm not surprised that, that the buy rate was so high. But he, to me, he was a very big disappointment in 2011. Mm. His, his body, he, he doesn't look good. He, he looks too big. I agree. And, and his matches with CM Punk were not good. I agree and, with that, too. Now you're and, talking me out of my own pick. <laughs> even the the WrestleMania 28 match with John Cena, you know, I was there and I could see them talking to each other, calling spots. It was it was a mess. Yeah. So I I really did not enjoy his run. I find him I found his promos and you know the rock concert stuff to be very entertaining, but his matches I found were terrible. 
Mm. So I, I, I love the rock growing up. You know, I, when I was in high school, I did like a student council promo to, for people to vote for me and pretended to be the rock and did my whole rock promo. Awesome. You know, he, he was the man, um, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, but 2011, he was a huge disappointment to me. And so I would not call that a good comeback. All right. All right. So uh, let's move on to 1984 and Jesse the Body Ventura. And this one is a little different because it's not like Ventura came back and won world championships and, and headlined all these pay-per-views or, or drew these sellouts in Madison Square Garden. But, you know, what he did do was he came back and he became an icon. He become, he became a pop culture icon. He's one of those guys from that era that just about everybody knows. Um, if you watch wrestling during that era, you know, you're, you're – you're bound to have quoted him at some point. Um, you know, when, when he was around the first time, he had a feud with Bob Backlund, and he was just about to start feuding with Hulk Hogan. I can't imagine that he was going to pin Hogan anywhere. He was probably going to wind up uh, doing a couple of jobs to Hogan, and um, you know, probably would have wound up back in the middle of the card feuding with Ivan Putsky or, or Tony Atlas. And here Jesse goes on and just becomes this this larger than life uh, personality on color commentary. Yeah, honestly, I don't know Jesse Ventura as a wrestler. I only mm. know him as the color commentator. Interesting. Uh, you know, I can just picture him with, you know, he his attire was always very interesting to me. It was um, always stood out to me. He had very interesting hats with the feather, um, you know. So I really didn't know him as, as a wrestler, but he definitely became very well known to me as a color commentator. And obviously people know him now because he was the governor of yep. uh, Minnesota. So to me, he, he's, he's known as, as, as a color commentator, not, and no one talks about his, his time as a wrestler. Yep. Yep. And finally, um, on the list is Hulk Hogan from 2002, his return in 2002. And, you know, this is, um, a guy that I didn't originally put on the list when I put the list together for the first time, I didn't have him on the list. And then I just kept going over the list and I'm like, you know, there's nobody here in, in this top, you know, 11, 12, 13 that had as much impact when they came back as Hogan did. I mean, Hogan had that classic with The Rock, The Rock in his prime. Um, Hogan did some good things. He won the championship during that run. Now, obviously, I'll be the first to admit that he didn't come anywhere close to achieving what he had achieved during his previous run. But I thought it was a hell of a comeback for a guy at his age. It's a totally different style of wrestling. It's a totally different era of wrestling. But yet, not only was was he still over, the guy was out there stealing the show at points. Yeah, I have to actually agree with, with your reasoning here. Um, I actually did take a break in watching wrestling um, in these 2003 – 2002 2003 time period um but i i have to agree that that yes it probably wasn't as impressive as you know his his run in the in the 90s but the fact that he was able to come back and do the things that he did that was impressive so like you said he he was able to <clears throat> stick with the attitude guys stick with guys like triple h austin rock he was able to still be Hulk Hogan the way people remembered him, um, despite, you know, the years away. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's my list right there. Um, who who didn't make the list that, that you thought belonged on the list? Obviously, you wouldn't have put The Rock on the list. So there's a spot right there open for you to put somebody. So who else would you have put on the list? All right. I have four people here. I'm going to start with the one that I know you're going to disagree with. <laughs> And that's Christian in 2009. Oh, okay. Because Christian, you know, he was just a mid-card, you know, light heavyweight tag team guy, you know, in his first run, WWE. He left and, and became a main event guy in TNA. Comes back in 2009, he's ECW champion, and maybe be, maybe it was because Edge had to retire, but he did finally get that world heavyweight championship and have a very impressive feud with randy orton yeah no you know um when you said christian um i thought to myself nah it, it doesn't work but when you break it down like that he did he he finally got that big singles push that 
I mean, at least for me, somebody like me wanted to see him get during during that end of that first run when he split from Edge and it looked like he was going to go places and. I mean, he did that. He did that tease of that feud with, with John Cena when he would start rapping about Cena, but yet they never they wrestled. I think like once or twice, but I think that it could have been much bigger than than what they did. But yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I I don't know if I would if I would put it over the Rock, but I could certainly see your point. Um, I really do. And you know, when you like I said, when you first said his name, I thought to myself, no way. But then you made a good case for him. You really did. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> next, I have Bob Backlund. Because mm. you know he he had a really obviously mo- monumental run. Um, I guess it was in the eighties, maybe even before that. Um, but when he came back ninety two to ninety four, he, he he like you said with Hulk Hogan in two thousand two. Even though he was in a different era, he still you know made it work with Bret Hart in ninety four becoming WWF champion. You know. He, the the character that he became that heel character is the character we've seen most recently from Bob Backlund at the Hall of Fame and and from time to time if he shows up you know he's this crazy Bob Backlund <laughs> right Bob Backlund from 1994 yeah you know it's funny because I actually uh, debated this with a couple of people on Facebook and through email and things like that because they put Backlund on the list and. I'm going to I'm actually going to use your logic with the rock um, as to why I wouldn't put Backlund on the list. And I'm probably the wrong guy because I have a special place in my heart for Backlund because Backlund was the champion when I first started watching wrestling. So I probably like him a lot more than than most people listening to this webcast or this podcast because I loved Backlund growing up and. Even to this day, I could go on YouTube and watch old Backlund matches from his championship reign against Morocco and Patera and Valentine and and sit here and enjoy it just as much as I could watch, you know, Michaels and Jericho. And for me, I thought Backlund's matches were terrible during this time compared to, again, you know, like The Rock, compared to what I saw growing up. I mean, you know, they just... I didn't like the character. I, I felt it was limiting. I felt like his matches weren't anywhere near nearly as good as they were from from what I watched growing up. And yeah, he won the championship, but you know we had it for five years. I think it was uh, growing up, and then he lost it. You know, in like thirty seconds to Diesel. Um, I certainly, if, if if this was a top fifteen list, he would definitely be on it for me. But for me, you know, using your same logic with the Rock, I, you know, I, I I didn't put him on there. Yeah, it's understandable. I think some of these guys, some of these people on my list, you know, probably have that similar argument as to maybe their first run um, was just so impressive that it was hard to to match up to it. And maybe yeah. if I had seen Bob Backlund during that time, maybe I would have felt differently. Sure. Um, but <clears throat> my next uh, pick was the Legion of Doom. Mm. I, I recently watched their uh, documentary on, on Netflix, um, and it was very interesting. And, you know, in 1997, they came back. Um, they had been going back and forth, I guess, between WWE, WCW, um, after their, their time in AWA and, 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 those, uh, and the NWA. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they, had, they, they did the whole thing with Demolition in their first run and the Heart Foundation and, you know, obviously proved to be the, the best tag team. I think this DVD actually made me feel that they are the best tag team of all time in wrestling. Um, they've accomplished, you know, gold in all the different promotions. Um, but even in 1997, again, they were able to to be there with with the new attitude. Um, you know, they they had Sonny with them now. Um, they they introduced draws to us, and they even were able to take um, Mike Hegstrand's you know personal life situation, and he was able to to put it on screen. You know, Animal talked in the DVD about how it might have been a little too close to home. But Hawk did it, and, and that was the attitude era, and so he was able to do it. And so, to me, these guys maybe their their first run was equal to to this run. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a great point, and I never would have even thought of that. That, but you know what? Um, you make some great points because their first run in the WWE F um was good, but. 
I think when you look back, some of the matches they had during that second run were even better. Um, they, I, I think they were almost more cartoonish during that first run against the Natural Disasters and those Nasty Boy matches. So they were a, a little more cartoonish where, you know, when they came back, they were a little more serious and they had some better matches. No, I, I, I you know what? I can't disagree with that pick. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I have one more, and I know it's going to be one of those, you know, this person, they're, they're, they, you can't capitalize on their first run. But again, they brought an, a, an attitude. They were able to, to match up with, with the new era. And that's the fabulous Moolah. Mm, interesting. She, she's obviously historically one of the best female wrestlers of all time. There's no denying that, but she came back in 1999 and won the champion, won the women's championship. Now at this time, the women's championship was, you know, bra and panties matches and, yeah. you know, mud wrestling, whatnot. But at her age to be able to do that was, was impressive to me. And, and she and Mae Young stuck around for, for a little while um, during the, during the attitude era. Yeah. Mae Young took the, uh, took the power bomb from Bubba through the table. Exactly. So, Fabulous Moolah definitely had, you know, a, probably a more memorable, um, historic run at first. But people who are like my age, who didn't grow up watching Fabulous Moolah, are going to remember Moolah and Mae Young from the Attitude Era. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you know, some I, I never would have even uh, thought of her. But yeah, so those are... Those are our picks. Um, as we wrap this up, um, anybody off the top of your head out of, outside of the WWE that that had one big comeback that really impressed you? That if I opened up this list to comebacks anywhere, uh, you would have put on it. I'm just starting to think about it now. When the first person that comes to mind is Scott Steiner. Hmm. Yeah. Big yes. pop. When he became Big Papa Pump, he became a much bigger deal. I mean, he he was a big deal as a tag team wrestler um, with with his brother, but he really took off as a single star when he became Big Papa Pump. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. And, you know, he left. He went to the WWE for a little while, and they did Japan and ECW, and he came back and had that big run as Big Papa Pump. So, yeah, yeah. definitely definitely qualifies for a comeback. Well, Seth, uh, you know, take as much time as you need, but um, plug away. Uh, this was great. Really enjoyed having you on there. Um, so, uh, where can the listeners of the podcast see or read more of you? Well, I just want to mention one other person if you're going to open it up, yeah. and, that's, and that's Kevin Nash. Yes, yes. Because, I mean, he was Oz and all these random people at first in WCW, and then after Diesel became Kevin Nash and then WO. Yeah, and he comes back and totally dominates. You know, another guy I thought of um, was uh, Sid, was Sid Vicious. Um, I kind of psycho Sid. I went back yeah. and forth on it as well. I mean, we're talking WWE now. You know, Sid won the title that first go around, uh, you know, against Shawn Michaels. But then he came back and he won the title again. And he was right in the mix with Bret Hart and Steve Austin and, and Shawn Michaels and Undertaker during that time period. It's just a guy that kind of popped into my mind uh, as I was, I was, I was uh, wrapping up the list. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even think of us. Uh, Sid. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, in any case, um, you know, I have, um, my own blog, gutwrenchpowerblog.com, G-U-T-T, wrenchpowerblog.com. I've actually been posting not just wrestling, but, um, NBA, basketball, movies, TV stuff on there too. Um, obviously everyone should check out Camel Clutch blog every Friday for my WWE wrestler of the week. Um, I've also now been more regu regularly, been writing for my friends over at ProWrestlingPowerhouse.com, which is where I used to do uh, my weekly podcast. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Seth Mikey, S-E-T-H-M-I-K-E-Y. Yes. Well, you know what, Seth? It was a lot of fun and uh, always a good time hashing these top ten lists. And, and, you know, everybody's got their own favorites. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it really is a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll come back and we'll throw around another list or two. I would love to, Eric. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, thanks for joining me and again. This is the Camel Clutch Blog Extra Podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes on the links uh, provided on the website or just keep checking back the Camel Clutch Blog. That's camelclutchblog.com for more podcasts or some archives. And thanks for joining us.
back. And then Bruno went on to a seven-year title reign. And not only was he a seven-year champion, I mean, the man just became uh, an immediate part of popular culture. I mean, you talk to people that grew up in that era. They they all know who Bruno Sammartino is. They all love Bruno Sammartino. Seth, when I looked at the list and I put it down on paper, I started with about 20. I just couldn't think of anybody else who had a better comeback than Bruno Sammartino. Yeah, like you said, he's a little bit before our time, and, and and you are definitely someone who, like you said, is friends with him and knows a lot more about his career than I do. But you you can't ignore the fact that, that when he came back, he, he had that illustrious run as as the longest running reigning champion of, of all time. And, and obviously, uh, last year with CM Punk's reign going um, as long as it did, um, it brought back uh, memories for people of Bruno Sammartino, and 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 look what ended up happening with him entering the Hall of Fame. So you know you can't you, you can't talk about comebacks without talking about the longest reigning champion of all time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I put the list out and I've gotten some feedback and um, I haven't had anybody argue with it. And yeah, you know, it's one of those things with Bruno where you didn't watch him. I didn't watch him growing up. I mean, again, before I, I watched him a little bit, he was on the way out um, when I when I started watching wrestling, but not, of course, uh, during his peak. But yeah, I have been fortunate enough to learn a lot about him just in, in talking to him. And I guess just, just becoming fascinated at that point. And what's what's cool now um, as we're recording this, Bruno's back in the fold and, and fans who didn't get a chance to experience Bruno and watch him will now be able to to relive uh, his, his glory days with DVDs and, and that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, Seth, um, when, you, when you look at it on paper, I don't think there's anybody else that's, that's number one uh, above Bruno. Uh, I have to agree with you. Great. Great. All right, let's move on to number two. And if there was anybody of best WWE comebacks, and as part of the criteria, um, what I did, and this this uh, shortened the list anyway, was um, I, I kept it to a year. So for anybody to be on this list, they had to have left for a full year or been out of the picture for a full year because right away I had people coming to me and saying Triple H, Eddie Guerrero, but these are guys that left for a long amount of time, but not quite a year. So what I did was I tried to keep it. Well, I did. I kept it to guys that left for a year minimum. And my criteria for, for putting people on the list was somebody that came back and, and came back bigger um, or maybe came back and, and made just a, as much of an impact as when they left. But somebody that came back and didn't necessarily achieve the same level of greatness that they had when they were previously in the company, they didn't make the list. Maybe top 15, top 20, but not top 10. So, uh, Seth, let's Welcome to another edition of the Camel Clutch Blog Extra, where we go deeper, take a more in-depth look at one of the more popular blogs on the website here on the podcast. And it is a real pleasure today to be joined by a gentleman who's been contributing to the website for well over a year now. He is the writer of the WWE Wrestler of the Week and has uh, pretty much taken over as the pay-per-view preview and prediction guy for the WWE on the CCB. And that is Seth Gutenplan. Seth, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure to to do this with you. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Really, really looking forward to it. Always a fan of your writings, and uh, I know you've uh, been been doing uh, podcasting of your own for quite some time. So I'm excited to to do this with you. Absolutely, same here. Excellent. All right, so let's get right into it. I put together a top 10 list. Kick it off here. Um, my first choice at the top of the list was Bruno San Martino. And I might be a little partial because I've interviewed Bruno uh, about a dozen times and uh, and, and I, I've got to be a friend of his over the years. So uh, it may be a little partial on my part, but I think when you look at best comebacks in WWE history, you got to put this guy right at the top of the list because he was in the WWE in 1961, uh, well before our time as as wrestling fans and our time on this planet. And he had a falling out with Vince McMahon Sr. and Toots Mont. He, he talked about it on my radio show a couple of times. He felt he wasn't getting paid what he was worth, so he left, and they actually blackballed him. They played a lot of games with him. They, they, they went to commissions and made sure that Bruno didn't 
didn't get licensed and he wasn't able to wrestle in that particular part of the country or that particular part of the world if they had that kind of clout. And eventually, Cooler Heads prevailed. Uh, they needed Vince and, and Toots needed to do something for business. Uh, Buddy Rogers was, was on the way out and they brought Bruno 